Good morning. It is time for our midweek Bible study. We are in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we've been through the first opening uh, passages. Uh, and of course, last week we saw really the beginning of Jesus' public ministry as he went into the synagogue in Capernaum. And this week we're going to continue uh, looking into that same day, uh, just later in the day as it starts out here, as Jesus and his disciples uh, leave the synagogue. They go into a home in Capernaum, and it's a home that uh, will probably really become kind of the the base of operations for a lot of the Galilean ministry of Jesus uh, during his time when he was in public ministry. Uh, so let me read to you, uh, starting at verse 29 is where we're going to be starting in Mark chapter 1, <clears throat> and then uh, we'll be going through about verse 39 tonight or, or this morning. And, uh, uh, but for, to start, I just want to read 29 through 31. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her and she began to serve them. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, again for the just the opportunity we have to gather around your word and, Lord, to learn from it. That's what we desire to do tonight, but not just learn to gain knowledge, but learn, Lord, so that your spirit might speak to us. <clears throat> learn, Lord, so that your spirit might mold and shape us. For, Father, that is what's important, not just learning for knowledge's sake, but learning, Father, so that we can become more like your son, Jesus. So help us to see that today and help us, Lord, then, to apply that in our lives as we go through this passage. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And immediately he left the synagogue. <clears throat> and again, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction to the Gospel of Mark, Mark is very much uh, a gospel of action. It's a gospel of movement. Mark does not linger long at any one location, nor does he linger long in telling us what was said, but rather Mark focuses on what was done. And that's exactly the case here. And immediately he left the synagogue. Of course, what has just happened? Jesus has been confronted by a man who has been possessed by a demon for some time. We don't know how long. Uh, Jesus confronted the demon. And when the demon did speak out, <clears throat> Jesus silenced him and then cast him out of the man. Um, and so we saw this very clearly uh, as Jesus exercised his authority over the demonic world. <clears throat> now we have a slightly different thing going on here. Um, Jesus leaves the synagogue and he enters the house of Simon and Simon's brother Andrew. And Mark tells us that also, of course, James and John were along, uh, the, all four of his disciples. And we see here some interesting detail because <clears throat> Mark records it. Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. Well, this tells us something. First of all, it tells us that Simon was a married man. And there is so little information about the families of the disciples that this, to me, is very interesting. That here Mark records this, that Simon's mother-in-law was there in Simon and Andrew's house. <clears throat> this also tells us that Simon's mother-in-law was most likely a widow. And her son-in-law had taken her in to care for her. Whatever the cause and whatever all the other details that are going on, what we're left with is, as Jesus and his disciples arrive, Jesus is informed that Simon's mother-in-law is ill, laying with a fever, it said. Or lay, or, now, Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. In other words, she's in bed. Uh, and the fever is not just a passing thing. The implication here is that <clears throat> this woman is very ill, possibly to the point of not surviving if something doesn't change. And so Jesus, without any words recorded, any other things recorded other than he was informed that Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, he simply steps up to her, took her by the hand, lifted her up, it says, and the fever left her and she began to serve them. 
no words spoken as in be healed. Um, certainly no, you know, slapping anybody on the head and slaying them. Just simply reaching out and taking your hand. And from that, the fever left her. The idea that, uh, as it's recorded there, that he lifted her up is really that he kind of helped her sit up prob properly or probably. <clears throat> and in that, she was healed. That's all it took. A touch. No phrases spoken, no words spoken, just a touch. And the fever leaves her. And it says she got up and started serving them. And that word serving there is the same word uh, that we translate often. Uh, it's the same root word that we translate our English word deacon from, diakoneo, or serve uh, in the verb form there. Um, and so it, it very much is this solid idea that she not only had the fever leave her, but her strength was restored in an instant. <clears throat> And in that, she begins to engage in the normal activities of a woman in that culture, serving her guests, meeting their needs. And so in all of this, in these three verses, 29, 30, and 31, we find some very interesting things. We see, first of all, of course, some very interesting family uh, history of Simon. He's a married man. Now, whether or not his wife is still alive at this point, we don't know. It's possible that his wife was already dead, and he may have been a widower himself. We're not told. Uh, we're not told any other details about Simon's marriage. But we do know he was married at some point, because his mother-in-law was living there with him. We know that she was ill. And then Jesus showed up. <clears throat> and this is kind of a counterpoint to the casting out of the demon in the synagogue, because that was purely a spiritual battle. There was no physical illness that this man presented with. That was simply a demon crying out in recognition and in fear and terror at the presence of Jesus. And here we have what I guess you could call a normal illness. Uh, there's no demonic influence here. It's just the fact that in the fallen world in which we live, illness is a part of it. <clears throat> People get sick. And Simon's mother-in-law had gotten sick. Uh, deathly sick is kind of the implication of the language. And just with a simple touch, the fever's gone. She's well. She's whole. She's strong. And so what we see here between the casting out of the demon in the synagogue and the healing of Simon's mother-in-law is the extent and the reach of the authority and the power that Jesus has. <clears throat> he can not only can, you know, command the demons to leave and to be silent, he can also heal with a single touch. <clears throat> and so the day passes. Sundown comes. Of course, at sundown, it is no longer the Sabbath. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus had been in the synagogue on the Sabbath, then immediately he left the synagogue and went to Simon's house. Now the sun has set. It is now after the Sabbath. It is a new day. And we, we pick up the account at verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. <clears throat> well, by now, with the healing of, or the casting out of the demon in the synagogue, and quite possibly even the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, word rapidly starts spreading through the city of Capernaum. Something is, amiss, something is up. Uh, not that something is amiss, but something is up. Um, again, remember the the response of the people in the synagogue to Jesus' teaching. He teaches as one who has authority. He's not citing previous rabbis. He's just telling it like it is. And then they see him cast out demons, and they're like, even the demons are listening to him. Maybe we better listen to him. <clears throat> and so certainly the word of that would have spread, but also quite possibly 
the word of Simon's mother-in-law being healed of an illness spread. And whenever there's the hope of healing, whenever, whenever there's the hope of freedom, people respond. It's interesting that the populace waits until sundown after the Sabbath. <clears throat> but then the crowd begins to form. And it says the whole city was gathered together at the door. Now, we're not sure how large Capernaum was in the days of Jesus. And quite possibly this is somewhat of a literary exaggeration, the whole city. <clears throat> but it certainly implies a large multitude of people, a large crowd. All who were sick, all who were possibly oppressed by demons, started showing up at the door of Simon's house, seeking relief, seeking healing, seeking hope, seeking freedom. And Jesus starts to work. Now Mark declares that Jesus healed many and cast out many demons. <clears throat> and you might say, well, why didn't he cast them all out? Well, he quite probably did. Uh, the many there in the Greek is more like a modifier of, to give you an idea of the number of people that he touched. In other words, it was a lot. And you think, well, how in the world could that, I mean, was the whole city sick? You know, I'll just say it this way. At my age, <clears throat> in my physical condition, I often have pain. Um, you know, I've got an ankle right now that is just giving me fits. Um, I've got sciatica down the other side of my body. Um, just nerve pain that will not quit. I still have tingling and numbness and pain up here on my forehead from the shingles I had last year. My shoulder hurts, my wrist hurts, my hip hurts. And if somebody were to come and tell me, you've got to go meet this man, because whoever steps in front of him is healed. I might go seek it out myself. And especially in a day and time when what we consider modern medical care, obviously, is not available. To have someone say, you can be healed. You can be freed from the oppression that you feel like you're under. Yeah, I would probably go seek it out as well. And apparently a large portion of the population of Capernaum did likewise. But there's another thing that Jesus does here, and, and, and I want us to focus on that for a moment. It says he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, this becomes really common practice. As you read through the rest of Mark, we'll see it. Um, and certainly in the other Gospels, <clears throat> Jesus did not allow the demons to profess his identity. Now, certainly the first one did. Um, and whether Jesus was caught off guard or, or what, um, I, I'm not going to try to determine you know, all of that. But I will say from this point forward, Jesus would not allow the demons to declare who he was. And I, and I want to ask the question, why? Why would Jesus prohibit the demons from publicly declaring that he was the Son of God, the Messiah? Well, perhaps some of it is <clears throat> not wanting to accept even a proclamation of truth from a purely evil source. And I can see that. Um, some might perceive the truth as being tainted uh, by the fact that it was a demon who professed it. But I think more likely than that is just Jesus' understanding of the time and the place and the people. As the Messiah, Jesus was fulfilling a role that had been predicted for centuries but that role had been poorly understood. And now by the time Jesus arrives, not just poorly understood, but misunderstood. The expectation was that the Messiah was not a spiritual leader, 
not one that was going to lead them into spiritual freedom, but a political leader, a new king to rise to the throne of David that would bring Israel back into preeminence again within the region, that would restore it to its days of glory, that would make it great and prosperous again. That was the view of the Messiah. And so to have that word spreading amongst the the public at large, that here was the Messiah, would simply lead to a great deal of confusion and would probably hinder his ministry. And Jesus was not about to let that happen. And so I think that probably has more to do with it. Although, again, there's certainly the possibility that he just didn't want something evil professing truth about himself. And I can go with either one of those. Because either one of those certainly could detract and hinder, detract from and hinder his mission. And his mission was not to come and free Israel politically and physically from slavery to Rome. His mission was to come and serve as a sacrifice for our sins, freeing us from the bondage and the slavery that we have to our sins. So I, I can understand why he might not want the demonic professing his identity. Which brings us to the last four or five verses here as we see it. Um, Jesus has left the synagogue. He's gone to Simon and Andrew's house. James and John are along with him. He heals Simon's mother-in-law and then works probably late into the evening, healing the sick, casting out demons from those who are oppressed, silencing the demons before they could even speak about him, before finally at some point being allowed probably to finally go to sleep. We pick it up in verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So after what was probably a very long night, Jesus arises early in the morning before sunrise and walks out into the wilderness, into a desolate place, implying an empty space, devoid of people. Devoid of interruption. And there he prayed. And that was his only intent, was to get off by himself and pray. And and this is not the only time that the Gospels record this. And I I believe in, in my heart of hearts that this was the normal start to the day for Jesus. Probably not a bad way for us to think about starting our days. Uh, when we have the opportunity, get off by ourselves, eliminate distractions, and pray. Of course, Simon and the others eventually awaken as well, and they arise, and they start looking around the house going, where did Jesus go? And they go off in search of him, and eventually finding him, of course. And I can imagine that when Simon awoke that morning, Perhaps there was another crowd outside his door. They may have dispersed the night before when Jesus finally said, enough, I'm going to bed. But at at some point, I I believe that the crowds probably came back because Simon tells Jesus, everyone is looking for you. And again, while that may be a literary exaggeration, it certainly speaks to the truth of the fact that by this time, knowledge of Jesus and, and his ministry had started to spread widely. And wherever he would stop, probably from now on, a crowd would soon gather once they knew who it was. And Simon tells him, everyone's looking for you. The desire to be healed and to be freed from demonic oppression is powerful. Um, Like I said, I I can understand it. I I would love to have my body completely healed right now. Um, But age and weight and lack of physical activity... Have left me where I am. It's my own fault. But I'd still love to be healed. And if the opportunity presented itself, I would probably take it as well. 
And so it's not unusual for me to have, hear Simon say, everyone's looking for you, because I'm sure by this point, a lot of people were looking for Jesus. And Jesus answers Simon, and he says, oh, yeah, you're right, let's go back into Capernaum. No, what he says is, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. See, Jesus <clears throat> did not come out to heal and to cast out demons. And while certainly a lot of that happened, that was not the focus of his ministry. That was not his focus. That may have been what it drew the crowds, and it certainly drew a lot of attention, but that was not the purpose of why he was out and about publicly ministering. It was to preach. It was to preach the good news about the kingdom of God. And so maybe there's another lesson that we can learn there, too, that as we go out and about, what are we out and about doing? What's our focus? What, what do we emphasize? With Jesus, it was to preach the good news. Now, along the way, yes, he cast out demons, and along the way, he healed people. But that was not the primary focus. The primary focus was the message. And it says he went out about Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons, preaching the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. <clears throat> and, and there's something, again, that, you know, I just want us to kind of focus on here in these last few moments. As soon as Jesus begins healing people and casting out demons, the crowds flock to him. But to me, it's obvious that their motivation was not to hear from the Messiah, was not to put their faith in him. For the most part, it's just like I said earlier, if somebody offered me a cure-all for my body, I would probably be seeking it as well. It's called self-interest. Or it's a desire to watch the fantastic. You know, we humans are often amazed at the fantastic. And so if we have an opportunity to see something that's strange and different and unheard of, we'll generally grasp at it. In either case, the crowd is not interested in placing faith in Jesus so much as they are just watching the fantastic, having their own self-interest met. But again, healing people and casting out demons was not the primary reason for Jesus' appearance. Those were simply manifestations of his power and authority to augment and to supplement the true purpose. To proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God was at hand. Repent and believe. You know, if we take nothing else from this lesson, I think it's important to take a couple of things here, uh, just in summary. First, of course, that example of getting off by yourself early in the morning and, and just spending time in prayer, not a bad example to follow. Second, <clears throat> what is our emphasis and our focus in our ministry? It ought always to be to bring glory to God, to lift up the Messiah, to point people to Jesus. People today are still hungry and, and looking for hope for freedom, for relief. And Jesus offers that. And that's what we need to be about doing. We need to be about pointing people there. That needs to be the focus of our ministry, whatever our ministry is. I'm of a mind to just simply declare this. Whatever ministry we have, if the focus of that ministry is not to lift Jesus up and point people to him, Perhaps we ought to think about a different way to minister. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you for your word. May we learn your lessons, and may those lessons, Father, mold us and shape us into the people you desire us to be. And so, Lord, we thank you for the time that we've had together here and ask you to use it now to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you next week.